Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this morning before House floor to consider an amendment that's being brought to us by the member from Stowe. Um, so I would love to, to give Representative Sherman a moment to, uh, to describe what she uh, is proposing as an amendment. You all can find that amendment on our committee page. Um, and then we'll have some committee discussion. So welcome Representative Sherman. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate it. I just literally left the other meeting, so I'm just uh, getting myself organized. But um, I think I spoke, my apologies, what? You just getting your feet under you? <laughs> yeah, really, I'm like, oh, uh, no. Um, but my apologies if I if I sound a little flustered. But um, I, I spoke briefly on this on the, on the floor yesterday, this uh, concern that I have um, with the bill. Um, uh, again, overall, I think I, 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 I thank you for doing uh, the bill and bringing it forward. I think it's important. I think, you know, it's all we need to get uh, we need to get this resolved and, and a long term uh, strategy in place um, for, to deal with our unfunded liabilities. And and I think this is um, uh, this is a good step toward that end. And, 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 and I'm hopeful that next year we'll, we'll have something in front of us that will will actually do 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 something uh, meaningful in that regard. Um, the issue uh, that I found in the bill was that it was was with one with one specific section. Um, it's in the definitions, um, and it relates obviously to the to the membership of the of of, of the VPIC and specifically in in section. Well, it's on page four uh, of the bill itself. At the top, it talks about um, the two members and one alternate appointed by the governor who shall each be financial expert uh, and independent. Um, and as that relates to the definitions um, under independent, uh, when you're talking about the definition of independent, there's a section, again, this is at the bottom of page two, uh, 3C, um, it, uh, an individual shall be considered independent pursuant to this subdivision uh, if the individual's spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law is a beneficiary of any of the plans, provided uh, the individual files an annual disclosure report to the commission. Um, sim my, my, my simple concern is I, I, I don't think um, that a, um, um, that the, um, that the potential or the, the perception or real potential conflict of interest um, isn't really, um, remedied by a, a, a disclosure uh, to the commission. Um, and, uh, and I really would like to ensure that the financial experts, uh, the, these folks are independent. Um, we have other members of the committee who are representing certain, um, um, uh, certain interests. And I would just like to ensure that, that the financial experts are, are in fact independent and, um, and that the perception is there for the, for the public and taxpayers uh, and everybody to understand that that um, that that is our goal here as um, as legislators that that these that these folks be truly independent and uh, and I just I worry that that um, disclosure doesn't doesn't remedy that so that is my my proposal is to just uh, simply delete that three uh, C. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just processing in my mind. Um, I, I completely understand your rationale for, um, you know, for, for wanting to, to have some uh, clear independence. I'm just sort of thinking in Vermont of those circles of connection. Um, so just trying to imagine what that looks like. Uh, Representative Anthony. Yes, uh, thank you, Heidi, for bringing this forward. Um, I'm a little puzzled, though, if you eliminate the entire section, what is it that assures greater distance or disinterest or uh, non-prejudicial participation by any appointee? I, I'm, I'm puzzled by your strategy, not your purpose, but I, I'm not sure that what you've done is actually executes what you uh, say you intend. Thanks. Well, I think I think the prior um, under A one and two um, actually ensures that those that the the definition of individual is somebody who 
uh, doesn't have um, um, a um, uh, a spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law, or anything. So I think that that is that's that's in that section of the bill prior to uh, in that section of the definition prior to it. So I I believe if I'm mistaken, if I'm doing something that I don't intend to do, I am. I am all ears, uh, um, but that was my intention with this with this amendment. And uh, if that's not uh, if that's not what I'm doing, I'm 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 hopeful. Uh, I, maybe Rebecca has a, a thought. I don't know. Good morning. Sorry, I miss I miss. Good morning, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. I miss the 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 actual question of what the I think he's he's concerned that just deleting the section uh, doesn't ensure the independence that I'm looking for um, and I I thought that uh, in 3a um, one and two ensures the independence uh, that I'm looking for uh, that 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 C is sort of is a uh, C has it, to do with the sort of relatives that's, of a member of the task force. So if you're well, removing so, C, then you're saying that um, uh, no. C, C is saying somebody can be a member of the task force if one of their relatives is a beneficiary of the system, but they just have to make a disclosure about that. So if you're removing that, then um, it's removing that uh, sort of exception exception to it. And so up above A1 and 2 ensures, and, and B actually ensures that the individual is not, um, well, A2 specifically is that the family is not, um, uh, you can't be a member if a family member is a beneficiary. I, I think that you could, you could have a situation where somebody is uh, married to someone who's a beneficiary and, and they are technically a beneficiary because they're relying on that on that in, uh, retirement income, for example. So that would, if you remove A, that I think that that does uh, take oh. away the ability for them to be married. I'm just using the word married, but, but some, yeah. some, some relationship where they are also relying on, they are also somehow a beneficiary of it through a family member. Yeah, we're not, we're not talking about removing A. He just wants to, uh, I don't know, I'm, I shouldn't speak. Um, Representative Anthony can explain what, what his concern was. Except he's frozen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, John Gannon, can you bring some uh, clarity to this? <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. That, that was why I had my hand up. <laughs> you were so Same. patient. <laughs> the amendment. <laughs> um, so what I believe um, Representative Sherman's amendment does is it does not provide an opportunity for someone to, to be independent by just having their, by filing an individual disclosure. So therefore, someone who has this conflict of interest could not serve as a member of VPIC. Under C, it allows a person to, to be considered independent if there's a disclosure filed. If we remove this section, you couldn't just file disclosure and be considered independent. You would not be independent. So and, Rep Representative Sherman, that's what you're going for, right? That, that is what I'm going for, yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, other questions, Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I understood that to be the, the way that the Representative Sherman is looking at that. Uh, I know initially I had a little bit of a red flag on that. I know we had talked about how Vermont is such a small state and uh, you know, there's, uh, it's kind of hard to, to achieve that. But uh, again, I, I can, thinking about it, uh, about it again, I, I, uh, I'm, uh, willing to support uh, Representative Sherman's amendment. Rep McCarthy. Th this might be a question more for Rebecca than Representative Sherman. I I just want to make sure that we understand that if, if we were to accept this amendment, 
that a financial expert in one of those seats that has the independent requirement that they wouldn't be able to have any family member that was a beneficiary of the plan. So like if, if there was a financial expert that was qualified, met, met all of those, that if they had a child who was a teacher, for instance, that there wouldn't be any way for them to be in that seat. And, and so I, I, I'm kind of of two minds about this. I mean, I, I, I just want to make sure I understand it, but if that's the case, I'm like, okay, I like the independence. That's what we're going for here with these seats. But then we also are shrinking the pool. So I just want to make sure we understand what we're talking about. So first, I would say that the financial expert and independence requirement is just applying to the appointees by the governor. Um, there is also in the case that the chair would be uh, would be unable to serve in that position and there would be an interim chair and that person would have to be a financial expert or independent. So it's just those sort of three scenarios in which this applies. Um, so uh, I think that the definition of independent says that the person does not have a direct or indirect material interest in the plan. Um, I think depending on, it probably depends on who you're talking about. For example, if an in-law is a teacher, um, if someone is a financial expert and they have uh, an in-law that's a teacher, I don't know if that makes them a beneficiary of the plan versus um, if somebody is has a spouse that is a beneficiary of the plan, I think that probably makes them also a, a beneficiary. So I think it probably depends on the relationship you're talking about. Sure, um, but in the, if, if I, sorry to interrupt you, Rebecca, but if I could just clarify. So if there was an appointee to one of those, those two seats, a candidate for the gubernatorial appointment to one of those two seats, and they happen to have a child who was a teacher. If we remove this, that their child being a teacher would disqualify them. If we keep this in with the bill as written, they could disclose that they have a child who's a beneficiary of the plan. Well, so the child one I think is a difficult because if they're not actually benefiting from their child's having uh being a member of the plan then i don't actually know that the language impacts them i mean the language says if the individual has a direct or indirect material interest in the plan and that means if they're if they are a beneficiary of the plan i don't know if someone's parent would be a beneficiary of a plan just by virtue of their their child um being a member of that plan so again i perhaps that child could could designate that person as a beneficiary somehow, but um, I don't think it um, immediately uh, makes them unable to serve. Okay, thanks. That's that's what I wanted to know. Uh, Representative Sherman, did you want to respond to that before I go to Rep. Gannon? Oh, um, I, I was just going to recommend just, just remove, like, uh, just recommend reading like it's really just a one and two and so it really just i was just going to say what rebecca said it an individual has a direct or indirect material interest in the plans if the individual is a beneficiary of the plan and then it goes on about the individual or individual spouse has been within the last five years an employee director that's all the publicly traded company stuff so it's really just an individual has a direct or indirect interest in the plan if the individual is a beneficiary of the plan. So in many cases, that is not gonna be the case. Uh, most cases I would suspect that um, is not gonna be the case that a child, that a parent is a, is a beneficiary of the child's plan or um, is a teacher or something. So that's, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Gannon. So just try to bring some clarity to this discussion. Um, and so Becky, if we look up at, um, page two, um, subsection th three, the definition of independence. Um, in 3A1, in, it, an individual has a direct or in, indirect material interest in the plan if the individual is a beneficiary of the plan. So, okay, so if they're there, however, if we move, remove C, there is no language above which relates to siblings, parents, 
So we would need to add that to that, that definition in, in Roman numeral one, I think to achieve what Representative Sherman is trying to do, which is say, if your spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law is a beneficiary of the plan, then you're not independent, right? And is that correct, Representative if, Sherman? If, that, if that's the intent that having that relationship to any of those people um, makes you uh, have a material in, or indirect or direct material interest in the plan, then you would have to add that to, uh, I think that 3A1, um, I think you would have to rephrase it to the individual or the individual spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law is a beneficiary of any of the plans. But I think it depends on what the intent is. Yeah. Do you, do you see what I mean, Representative Sherman? I'm like, just trying to, to, to no, get I you do. to where I you are. What you mean. I'm trying to, I'm now I'm trying to, um, um, Boy, uh, is I guess the good, question. No, is that's good. That's a good catch, uh, Representative Gannon. I just um, that's. So that was what had me scratching my head when when you no. initially talked about it because the, then the question becomes: it is, is are you not independent if you have an in law, for instance, who is a beneficiary of the system? Because I don't know whether that necessarily creates a conflict for uh, for most people. But if that's what you're going for, then we need to figure out what that list of um, relation, uh, the relationship circles, what does that list look like to you if that's what you're aiming for? Yeah, that's a, boy, I, I um... The, the good, the great catch. Uh, obviously, both of uh, all of you. I just. Oh, um, well, let's let's let you chew on that for a moment, because Representative Hooper has his hand up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Heidi. Uh, I, I'm trying to figure out what tail the dog is trying to chase here. Uh, when we talk about eliminating all of these people. Uh, we're probably talking about eliminating from the pool of qualified candidates something that approaches 100,000 people in the state of Vermont, because this is a pretty broad net. Everybody that sits on VPIC is obligated by the, fed the fiduciary responsibility that sort of uh, limits anything they can do in terms of self-serving. But thirdly, VPIC does absolutely nothing to do with benefit structure, benefit amounts, anything that has to do with benefits, it's solely, uh, that, that responsibility remains with the legislature. It's solely uh, obligated to make money. And quite frankly, <clears throat> if my son or daughter is a teacher <clears throat> and they're relying on that retirement plan in the future, I'm sort of going to be more motivated to do the best job that I can because I don't want them living in my basement. Um, so I, I, I don't know what. Uh, I, I, can, I, I can I can um, I, I can do that, I think, pretty easily. It's um, it's perception. It's the perception. It is the um, the um, assurance that we are giving to the people of Vermont that that independence is there that's that's what it is so i i'm not again as i when i when i was as i continued from 2013 arguing for an ethics uh, commission in the in the house a lot of you were on this or some of you were on this committee then and kept but um uh i i it's the perception i think that you know, we might be a small state you might be able to see everybody and talk to them at the at the gas station, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're free of conflicts or the perception of conflicts. Well, um, so that's never... so that's I I it is it is um, you know we're very accessible, but that there is the there is the potential for conflicts, and so I just want to ensure that the Vermonters know that the independence is there. And in the 
I think since 2005, this has really not been raised as an issue. And at this point, you're talking about two, maybe three people on the board. Yeah. So yep. again, it's not, I'm not saying it's unworthy of consideration, but it's, I don't think as big an issue as maybe we're creating. Thank you. So Representative Sherman, have you had a chance to <laughs> think about what, what circle of familial relations uh, you were going for in terms of um, establishing <laughs> independence? You know, um, I, I guess I would, I would, um, yeah, I have, I, I think most definitely um, um, a spouse, the individual or spouse is a beneficiary, um, maybe changing that in I and um, um, and um, parent, child, sibling, parent, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think, I, I guess I'm trying to You know, I just worry about, I worry about it. Um, um, I, I would, I, I guess I would say the in-law, I, I think is, um, because that could be even a sister-in-law or something. Uh, um, but I, I just, I, I, yeah, I guess I would like to say, um, I, I would like to change this. My apologies, Madam uh, Chair, for this. Um, if the individual, uh, individual spouse, parent, or child is a beneficiary of any plans, and again, this is only this is a very select group. Uh, so, so cross, not the in-law. It okay. would be spouse, parent, child. Um, I think, and then the sibling. Again, that you know, that's um, sibling or in-law would be. I, I, I just. Um, that I'm, willing, I'm willing to do that. Yeah, that's just a little, yeah. um, but uh, the individual spouse, parent or child. And again, this is, um, um, so I guess Rebecca, can we, can we change it? Uh, can we, can I make sure I change that amendment to deleting C, but adding um, in A1 spouse, parent or child? Uh, yeah, I can, I can make that change. I just have to figure out how to, how it would be presented on the floor, but I can. I can do that now. <laughs> okay. So I, I guess that's what I'd like to change it to, uh, Madam Chair. Um, if that is, well, that's what I'd like to change it to. And okay. thank you for the catch, uh, Representative Gannon. I, I, I didn't catch it. Uh, Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Sherman. Um, <clears throat> does, <coughs> I'm going back to Representative Hooper's observation <clears throat> that because this group is really focused on making uh, the, the fund perform, um, I'm just wondering, uh, since it appears that it will eliminate a couple of current members, uh, I I'm hesitant because, uh, frankly, one of the things we were urged to be conscientious about was continuity as well as independence. And I'm not sure that a group that's focused on making the fund make money uh, somehow is in conflict with being a beneficiary. That's sort of where I'm stuck. I'm not sure whether that's exactly what Rep Hooper said, but this, uh, this is not an issue of wanting to sell the state anything or wanting to change the beneficiary structure. That happens elsewhere. Um, so I guess, again, what, what is, what's the conflict in, in standard terms? I mean, these don't seem to be, they almost seem to be complementary objectives. That is to say, make money so the fund is healthy. Um, and, and that would be in the interest of any beneficiary from my point of view. So I'm kind of stuck as to the, the notion of appearance. Representative Gannon. 
Thank you. Um, no, I, I understand Representative Sherman's concern. Well, obviously the performance, you know, good performance is good for, for beneficiaries. The, the v, VPIC also does another thing, which is it sets the assumed rate of return. Um, and as we know, if you set, you know, that is something that does impact the pension directly. If we set the assumed rate of return too high and our performance isn't good, um, that may lower the ADAC payment for a year, um, but um, can increase the unfunded liability um, after that year. Um, so I, I do think there is an appearance of independence here. Um, throughout this bill, we have tried to ensure independence of various people. Um, I, I think this would be a good change um, once we see some language. <laughs> Uh, now that I understand it more, I, um, I'm inclined to agree. Um, I can get comfortable with this. Um, any other committee discussion? So Becky, if we give you screen share, are you able to show us what you have magically created? All right, you are co-host. Go right ahead. Um, and I, I have to just send this to editing, but um, wait. bring this up. Hold on one second. Okay, do you all see that? Yes. Okay, um, so the change is highlighted in yellow. Um, so I, uh, the change would be in 3AI after uh, where it says the individual is a benefit, the individual you'd be adding or the individual spouse, parent or child. So it would read the individual or the individual spouse, parent, or child is a beneficiary of the, of the plans. Um, and then still striking out subdivision 3C. Okay. Questions from committee members? Representative Anthony. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Becky. Uh, I, my reticence has to do with the continuity uh, aspect. And I, I would like a read on, and I suppose Rebecca's the ideal person, we have provided in the transition that the folks who are currently there will serve out their terms. Do I understand that with this change, nobody will be uh, removed uh, prior to the transition or am I, I don't have the full document in front of me, so I'm sort of struggling from memory, but there is a transition language. And I, I think it's important for the folks who are there to serve out their terms. And then the new language triggers, if you will, the, the filter for appointment to the new team. That's the way I would think about it, but I, I wanna be assured that that's the way it's gonna work, thanks. Um, so that is correct. There is transition language. Um, the, uh, let me just, so no, so everyone who's currently serving would be able to serve, um, until at least one year before their term is expired and their ability to be reappointed, um, depends on meeting the qualifications in the bill. The, the new qualifications and whether or not they have exceeded their uh, the maximum term limits. So um, for the two members who are appointed by the governor who have this financial expert and independent um, requirement, they would, uh, I'd have to look at the term what their current term expirations are. I, I, I don't remember those, those two members term limits, um, but they would be able to serve until one year prior to the June 30th of one year prior to when their term is up. 
Um, whether or not they can be reappointed de depends on if they meet this independence, this new independence requirement. And if I may, a follow up. My understanding, uh, again, this is from my memory, maybe John or, or Madam Chair um, or Rep Hooper, the current uh, chairman, uh, Tom Galanka, does not run afoul of this. So I understand that or am I wrong about it? That is to say, he's not a beneficiary, nor his spouse, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead, Rep Gannon. I, I don't believe he runs afoul of this. I That's mean, what I kind of remember. And again, I'm, I'm interested in so. I think he, he, he was very, you know, I had a number of email communications with him. He never indicated that this was an issue for him. Great. I, I appreciate it. Again, I'm a continuity person here. I want the transition to go as well as it possibly can. Thanks. Representative LeClaire. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I, I do want to point out that we're only talking about um, basically three of these positions on this 10 member board for one and two. Um, I know there's been some concern about the pool from what we, which we could draw from for these financial and independent experts. But if I'm reading this correctly, it's my understanding that it doesn't have to always be somebody that comes from within the Vermont borders. The governor could appoint somebody um, that meets those qualifications, but they don't necessarily have to come from Vermont. Not that that's a good thing. Naturally. <laughs> Yeah, there's no re there's no residence requirement um, in the language, um, and also I just checked the VPIC website, and um, it it happens that those two government governors appointees, their terms expire June thirtieth, twenty twenty two, which under this language would have those two positions being reappointed June thirtieth, twenty twenty one. Representative Gannon, and then let's see if we can put this to a vote. Well, that, that, that is what I was going to do, Madam Chair. I was going to move to find this amendment favorable as we saw it on our screen a few moments ago. All right, are we ready to have a vote? Uh, Representative Hooper. So just to be clear, this eliminates any and all disclosure requirements for everybody. Although there is currently an annual disclosure as part of the VPIC rules. So I imagine that would not prohibit that, right? <coughs> I believe Representative Gannon is nodding his head. Yes, that, right. that is correct, Representative Hooper. So this is, we're voting on uh, Representative Sherman's okay. amendment amended. If you can wait a couple of minutes, we're friendly about to vote on something. That we friendly amend amended. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Rep Merlicki, you are unmuted. Sorry. Yeah, what's the, what's the signal for that? <laughs> <laughs> Universal sign of muting problem. <laughs> Please mute. Please mute. All right, um, Rep. Colston, are you ready to call the roll? I am ready. I shall call the roll. Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. Leclaire. Yes. Hooper. Yes. With reservation. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Behovsky. No. The fave. I certify this representative Lafave. And your vote? I didn't hear. Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Higley. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. The vote is 10 1 0. Thank, thank you all. And again, I thank you for your uh, catching. Um, Glad I got what I uh, was actually going for. I clearly I I miss I I, I didn't do uh, it completely well, but I appreciate the help, Representative Gannon and all. So thank you. 
see you all on the floor.